was born in Po, Manana Mangadi. I was born in a village, uh, which is quite important for me to highlight, I think, in this political journey. And I was raised in an extended family, I guess, like many different families in this country. Uh, my mother was second born or, or, or in a family of nine kids. And I normally, now when I look back, I perceive her as the poorest in the family. She was not educated. And so I guess that's why she stayed at home with my grandparents uh, to raise me and my siblings. So I grew up in the same village. I did Mabutani. This village is called Mabutani, north of Bujani, the mining town. So I grew up in this family. I did my primary school in the same village, uh, my junior secondary school in the same village. And I, you know, it, I think what really defined my politics, my mother was um, an active politician, if you may, but she was an activist. She, for, I, I guess, I will just say the ruling party. So that kind of defines how I perceived politics of this nation. And uh, unfortunately, she died when, in a car accident, going to a political party conference when I was doing Form 2. And I think that kind of defines how I perceived politics. At that uh, young age, I decided that I am not going to join politics. I am not interested in politics. I wanted to be a scientist, so I read a lot about science. Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be, you know, a NASA scientist, some type of scientist I wanted to be. And I was quite clear that politics will not be my journey. I was fascinated by this uh, science that, oh, wow, we can actually study the mind and, and mental processes. So I got very curious about psychology. And I knew at that time that I wanted to study psychology. And I was fortunate enough to go to Miami uh, for undergraduate because at the time we did not have a program here in Botswana. So the government sent me there to study psychology. When you grew up in Botswana, you possibly, and grew up in Botswana and grew up in a village, you have possibly never interfaced with racism. So I think for the first time in Miami, I met racism face to face where <laughs> I remember one time I was entering a bank and, and, and some old lady looked at me and said, go back and, and go and pick cotton. So I got very curious about, you know, culture and outside psychology. I started taking courses about American culture. Uh, American culture through film, uh, U.S. government, uh, philosophy, because I really wanted to understand, you know, why would people become so racist? I started watching Bo Martin Luther King because that was the space where I was. Bo Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, you know, those uh, activists who fought uh, discrimination and racism. So I guess that kind of developed my interest in politics, and I thought... You know, I realized at that time that you cannot live as a human being. You cannot live outside politics. So, but still I was very sure that, you know, politics is important, but I still was not interested. I guess I had not dealt with the, the trauma of losing my mother to politics. And then I studied for master's in industrial psychology to San Diego, uh, San Diego, California. When I was there, as fate will have it, I stayed with a very an older woman. I wanted to focus, so I chose, I said, you know, definitely with the stipend that I have, I'll need a roommate, but I wanted an older person so that I'm quite, you know, focused because graduate studies are quite difficult. So I stayed with this woman who uh, was an activist of the Democratic Party, the U.S. Democratic Party. And around that time, uh, uh, George Go, Al Go, sorry, Al Go had lost to George Bush. And this woman was a staunch supporter and a staunch activist in the Democratic Party. And uh, the first campaign, political campaign that interested me, and I worked with her when uh, they're doing the door-to-door -door campaign, was the John Kerry campaign. So I go with her, and she had a lot of friends who would come over, discuss politics, and I still did not want 
to enter the political space. But I was curious, as a student, as a learner, as somebody who saw, you know, the misfortunes of, of, of racism, who experienced racism for the first time, the inequalities and whatnot. And I think through staying with Sylvia, her name was uh, Sylvia Petrosian, I, because we watched a lot of political documentaries, uh, a lot of political debates, and just to see between John Kerry and George Bush who was better. I saw the, 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 the contrast in my country, Botswana, which is considered to be a developing country, and the American context. And I realized that politics had everything to do with everything. And then through this experience of, of, of living with somebody who was a, a, a partisan person, I realized that um, political parties, through ideologies, through ideals, their beliefs, values, they influence directly so uh, economic, uh, economic structures and economic development of nations. And I realized that for you to be a serious human being, you cannot live outside politics. So I think at around that time, I decided that I'm already an activist here of, of sorts. And I knew that when I come back to Botswana, I'll kind of become an activist. And at the time, I thought I was very sure that I will not be a frontliner as an, uh, a, a politician the way that I've, I've since become. So I came back home and uh, around 2005, I got married, uh, had two boys uh, with my ex-husband. And, uh, and then at that time, I decided that when I looked at the state of my nation, and like I said, the knowledge that I gained, Yahore, um, development is influenced directly by politics and ideology. So I started looking for a political home that kind of uh, espoused similar values that I had developed, right? And uh, looked at the BDP. I knew that the state of my nation had everything to do with the ruling party. And I perceived it as a very capitalistic party. It kind of created the gaps between the haves and the have-nots. I also that realized or had an awareness of nations. They should have been similar to us because we gained independence around the same time, right? When you look at Malaysia, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Mauritius. We all gained independence in the 1960s. And when you look at where they are in terms of development, I realized that both political frameworks and the leadership, as in the men and women who hold political positions, they have everything to do with the status quo of my nation. So while my mother was uh, a BDP activist, I knew for sure that I will not enter the political space as a BDP uh, activist because I kind of said Tomu Kuraha is the reason that Botswana is underdeveloped as it is. And uh, so I looked around, shopped around, and the party that kind of influenced me more, and also because of the personalities that I found, was Botswana Congress Party. You know, Redu Nelang, I consider him my one of my political mentors. Me Muse Rapelana, Bome Mashagwa from the Botswana Congress Party. They really, I looked at them and I said, this is a party that kind of espoused similar values. And these are the types of politicians that I'm attracted to. So I did house to house campaigns uh, for different candidates from Ine Redu Nelang Salushando. Uh, to the likes of uh, <laughs> Anamu Tahudi, she was a member of, of, of BCP at the time, uh, through Nemara Pelana, who ran Mo uh, Pakalani Habroni North constituency. So I think that experience exposed me to a side of Botswana that I did not know exists in terms of disparities. You know, for the first time, I entered into places like Extension 27, uh, Gobo, uh, Old Naledi, 
And I saw abject poverty like you've never seen before. And I began to understand why Botswana is named among the five most unequal nations on earth. I used to defend that, hey, when I was a student outside and people were talking about African poverty, I used to think, no, we're not that poor. And then I realized that village life and, you know, the so-called ghetto life in, in, in Kaburoni is quite different. So I think that really made me realize that politics is indeed extremely important, right? It's something that we cannot stay on the sideline. So I began openly campaigning. Because initially when I started, I was more like behind the scene. You know, I didn't want to be seen. Uh, my husband at the time was a businessman and uh, I was quite very careful because you do not want to kind of put his business in, in, in harm's way anyhow. So as I started seeing these disparities, I kind of concluded that we need to change government and it is the only way that we can change economic conditions of our, our country. So I became open about my political participation. And uh, in around 2019, uh, we, just prior to that, the Botswana Congress Party became uh, a coalition partner under the umbrella for democratic change. And then I was called by a number of people at the party saying, Paul, there's a, an opportunity to represent the Zwana Congress Party and the Umbrella for Democratic Change as a parliamentary candidate. My initial answer was no. And at that time, because I grew up in a very gender neutral family, right, where my grandmother was the matriarch of the family, I, when I grew up, I was pretty much a tomboy. I played with boys. I made cars out of wires. I mean, I, I was just a normal, you know, typical tomboy. I would run around with boys. I played sports. So I wasn't a very sensitive to gender bias. So when I joined uh, uh, in 2019, when I was called, I had already seen it. I had already seen the bias against equality candidates like Emuze Rapilana, who the, BD, the BCP long believed in her. She was a party chairperson, right? And I had the only thing that I could justify her losses on was her gender. And um, so I was very frustrated and I said, and, 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 and you know, the vile, the persecution, the name calling, uh, and I think another one that kind of made me very sensitive to say I don't want to put my person in the forefront was Malis Habo. I remember at the time, I believe she had wanted to be a president of the BNF and they drew her with big cow private parts and just basically just, you know, dehumanizing her for even daring uh, to want to lead, uh, you know, the Botswana National Front. So I was very sensitive. I said, I'm a professional. I have two kids and I don't want to deal with that profiling, you know, public profiling. So I resisted, but enough people came and showed confidence. You know, even my party president said, Paul, you know, you know, there's this phrase that we use a lot here. Uh, the phrase is, like, you know, the people say I should run for a political office. So eventually, I agreed, and then hell broke loose. And for the first time, I realized that I was a woman, and I now had lived experiences. So, you know, gender stereotypes, prejudice, uh, discrimination, and outright defamations, you know, I was called weak. I was called uh, a, a female version of a womanizer. I don't know if there is a word that you can call manizer. I was called a whore. 
uh, there were sessions that I was sleeping with the president of the umbrella, the president of my own party. And I saw this things on social media and I was in shock. And I realized at that time that, oh, so women are, are good enough when they are running as activists. And for the first time, I felt victimized. I think being a tomboy that I was, I'm not the type of person who gets easily or who allow myself to be victimized. But during that phase, if I, were, I was being honest, I really did feel victimized and I was angry, I think, for lack of any other sophisticated word. And I said to myself, these people, they don't know that when you tell them for that, you cannot do X. Paul says, yes, I can. So I kind of wore that head that, yes, I am going to do these things. They kind of strengthened my resolve that, yes, I wasn't interested, but because they're saying I cannot, I'm going to do it. And I was quite uncomfortable, hey, with the labeling politician. For a very long time, I stayed on the sideline. I felt like, you know, given the, the, the traumatic experience of losing my mother in the political trenches, um, I don't know, I, I felt like I'll be betraying her by playing in the same space. So I, I, I guess when I, I became a, a politician, I experienced what in psychology we can call some existential crisis where I was kind of almost redefining myself. And uh, I think the plight of Batwana won. Uh, I often tell people that once you see certain things in the political trenches, you know, through house to house campaign, you see, you know, people, 25 people staying in, you know, a three roomed house, 25 people. There are certain things that you see and you cannot unsee. And I think all those experiences also kind of strengthened my resolve for political, for, for, for saying, you know what, Mpo, you will, you have to become a politician. One of the things that really made Botswana Congress Party very attractive for me was the, the constitution of the party. It actually does say we are revising it and our hope is that we'll get somewhere close to 50% representation in different committees, be it the central committee and the party executive. So in our constitution, it is unconstitutional for any committee or any party structures to not have at least, as of 2021, 20, uh, at least 30% representation. And we are also, because we follow the social democratic uh, ideals, uh, we see social inequity as, as something that is counter-development. So the party at policy level uh, saw me as an, as an equal, but I was quite surprised to uh, receive some type of pushback by some male counterparts within my political home. And the pushbacks are not usually overt. I mean, people don't come to you. They... They started as propaganda and as, you know, where you are not understanding what is going on. And the bigger pushback came from the umbrella for democratic change. I was called weak, you know, by candidates who, or by activists or politicians who have no rights calling me weak. I was called weak. My only weakness was being a woman because I had been married. Marriage is one of the most difficult things that you can ever face. I was raising a family. In terms of education, I went, you know, up the academic ladder all the way to a PhD. So the only thing that I kind of associated with my uh, weakness was my gender. And I did confront, uh, you know, it was written or reported in newspapers. I confronted the specific individual who called me weak and I asked him. And he was quite sincere. He did indicate that, you know, Botswana is not ready for female politician. And one of the sure ways of losing elections is uh, by fielding a political, a female political candidate. 
And I mean, now we're friends. We kind of had a long discussions. And it kind of also opened my eyes to the realities of, of female candidates in this country. And uh, the honest truth is that it is very easy to malign female candidates because of one big thing, culture. You know, we are, we exist in a very patriarchal culture. Even in cultures outside, uh, the political space is very masculine, is very patriarchal as well. So the norm is men, even to women. And women who look down on your candidacy, they don't do it out of spite. They do it out of, you know, what they consider normal, who they consider a leader. And it's very easy to defame a female candidate as a bully, as rude, as aggressive. We are fair game, women, when it comes to propaganda. Because, you know, politics, unlike organizations, you know how organizations have defined structures, are hiring uh, protocols and practices. Those things are not defined. And you are a woman. You find people who are occupying the political space. And those are men. And it's, it's, it's not that easy. Because for them, you coming in, they perceive as pushing us out. And also, what I realized, and now I realize, and I can say it without even blinking, that men are not interested in us normalizing uh, gender representation in the political space. Because for them, it means less access to that space. And I don't think men uh, are, are, are anyway confused about our competencies or our abilities to lead because women lead in different spaces. In this nation, most families are single-headed by women because men can leave you with doing one of the most uh, important jobs, which is taking care of kids. So if they're, they're that confident, they know very well that we are... Uh, we are competent and we can achieve. We know that when we go into those spaces, we are going to excel. Because I don't know any female uh, legislator in this country who did not excel. Uh, okay. Uh, apart from the current parliament, and I'll say it without even hesitating, the likes of Bom Masireles, the Bom Nema Chiepe, they were quite instrumental in defining... Uh, certain policies, right, for this nation, that they're very much competent. The likes of, you know, our former speaker, Mim Manasha, they were quite, uh, 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 they demonstrated competence, right? Even uh, the likes of Bonebome Makato. She was not a terrible uh, uh, female representative. So I think male counterparts, they are aware of that. But because they know that we need to compete for a set number of space, 57 spaces. They don't want us to crowd that. They don't want to normalize female representation. So they're pushing back. The pushback uh, from where I'm sitting is quite intentional, right, and self-serving. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist by training, and uh, my training it's in the space of talent development, human capital development, uh, best utilization of human capital. And uh, one of the, 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 the things that really made me realize that, or also gave me confidence for the poor, you need to come into the space, was the knowledge that sexism, the way it is practiced in patriarchal cultures like ours, it, it, it comes at a, at a very big cost to the nation, to the economic development of the nation. Because if our nation is, uh, has 2 million people, the statistics, the current statistics indicate that women are around 51% of, of, of our population. And from human capital perspective, this nation, we don't have the liberty to choose who contributes to the economic development of this nation. We need to fully utilize 100% of the citizenry, right, 
take health and education, right? Earlier, I want to mention that this nation, most families are single-headed by mothers. Uh, when uh, looking at health, right, when somebody is sick, an elderly, a mother is sick, we know that the health system or infrastructure in this nation is a disappointment. And normally the people who are burdened with care in this nation are women. From that context, when I come to the policy making table, like parliament, the people who are likely to bring a perspective, you know, regarding how to best take care of mothers and fathers uh, who are elderly, who need care, who are those? It's women. When we take another big issue, which I think is one of the big, big issues in this nation, I will couple, you know, education with youth, youth issues, whether it's youth unemployment, are the people who are burdened because, like I said, they are single mothers, they are raising families. So when we're talking about the quality or reprogramming education, improving the educational infrastructure, be it... Uh, you know, uh, afternoon programs, uh, be it uh, teachers, be it, you know, just quality of education, provision of food at, home, at schools, the people who are burdened with those burdens are women. So when we come to that table, we bring those perspectives, because of, you know, how the society is structured. Men do not have those perspectives because they have the leeway, like I was saying earlier, of leaving a woman with five kids and moving on and never looking back. So given those dynamics, I've, I've become very passionate about, you know, ensuring that while the society or while male counterparts may say, Paul is not ready, I know I'm ready because... What I have seen in the political trenches, it kind of goes against even my training as somebody who I was saying is, is quite interested in uh, ensuring the full utilization of human capital that this nation, this nation, above all other nations, given our population, we cannot go anywhere without tapping into young people without tapping into women to ensure that all of us, men need to start realizing the cost of uh, sexism. Our country is very ageist, is very sexist, I guess because of patriarchy. Politics will rob you financially. When I ha went into politics, I had some savings. I was going through a very traumatic divorce and politics ate everything. I had wanted to provide the best of the best for my two boys, the best education, the best everything. I found myself at a negative because the campaign in this country, there's no political party funding, right? So politics took everything from me because of what we saw as rigging, we decided to uh, petition the elections. We did. And, you know, the lack of objectivity in the institutions that are supposed to support democracy in this nation and the reasons that we were given for rejecting our, our, our cases, and I was really discouraged, hey, because as an African, I had seen a lot of African states that went down, the likes of your boy Zimbabwe. I had watched, you know, ANC, you know, just watching Re Jacob Zuma mismanage the country. And I knew that lack of proper institutions and independence uh, institutions in this nation is one of the greatest limitations. I was really much discouraged that if the ruling parties in our nation, the so-called one of the oldest African democracies, 
the so-called uh, beacon of democracy in Africa and the world, if we can go through this and the world seems not to care, what is the point of uh, continuing to pour money, personal resources into politics when you can lose, uh, perceive that elections were rigged and they're supposed to be independent institutions, not even one to give you a chance. When I entered into the political space, I was very naive. I really perceived myself as an equal because of my upbringing. And I noticed uh, very late that, no, Mpo, you might perceive yourself as an equal, but you are not. To those who are supposed to aid the process of decision making, you are not. And that has uh, certain ramifications for your candidacy or your political participation. I have uh, trusted people that I should not trust. And it took me a minute to realize that politics is a dirty, filthy game. Okay? And whether you want it to be or not, that's a different thing. The reality is that when you go into political uh, ground, you have to be prepared. And I think I went there head first and I did not see what came, even at my family level. I mean, my poor ex-husband, I think he was targeted politically because uh, the wife at the time was, you know, involved in opposition politics. So I think trusting and naivety is something that I'm still developing and uh, realizing that just because you, 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 you want politics to be clean, they are not clean. And when you enter that space, you have to be aware of it because otherwise it's like going into a land, uh, a land mine without knowing that you are going into anywhere. You, whether you are innocent or not, you will get blasted. Navigating the political scene as a woman, you can't go there as gender neutral because the observers, both men and women, when they see you, they see a woman first. And when they see a woman first, they also don't see competence. Uh, the gender bias just say, you are not ready. You are emotional. If a man can take a microphone and say, when you say the same thing, the backlash is different. So I think gender sensitivity, even for us as women, it's something that we have to know that you can't just copy your, your male candidates because the implications and the costs are different. What we see uh, at the 12th parliament, which is the current parliament, is not a true representation of our, our nation. So the only way we can address the societal challenges that are facing us as a nation, as Botswana, is when all perspectives are considered when we are dealing with uh, national issues. And young people have a lot to do with bringing youth perspective Females have a lot to do with bringing youth perspective. So we need to recognize that and see representation as a civic duty, as a civic responsibility. Staying as a bystander is not the answer to the socio-economic conditions that we are facing because politics define everything. The reason why Zimbabwe was this Zimbabwe and now is the current Zimbabwe that we face is because of politics. The reason why we started at the same pace with Malaysia, uh, Mauritius, Singapore, and now Rwanda is almost surpassing us uh, is because of politics. So politics define your being. Staying on the sideline is giving those who have been misruling the permission co to continue misruling so if you are uncomfortable with the status quo of this nation, development, your own uh, uh, entrepreneurship, your own education is dependent on the decisions that are made by politicians. So you cannot allow uh, just about anyone to go and make decisions for you. When you stand on the uh, sidelines, you are saying, what I see 
at the decision-making table, which is parliament, is okay. I see women all the time in the trenches in this nation, laying the carpets, dressing the tables, and I'm saying you have a right to come and demand your seat at the decision-making table. Botswana and Africans, uh, women, we are good enough. We are not only good enough to lay the carpets for our male counterparts, and we are good enough to stand there, to sit at that table and help form policies, form programs that will be uh, important for you and your kids. Ultimately, uh, somewhere in the next couple of years, I will run for the highest political office, which is the presidency of our nation, Botswana.